my main interest going into mechanical engineering was energy and uh, the environmental impacts of energy and sort of uh, can't we do that better? Can't, can't we do things right? That would be good. So that's, that's where I've been working for um, nearly 30 years. And I was asked to come and talk to you guys. I'm told you're all business leaders. And I was told to challenge you. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to challenge you with, with some things. And we've got a lot to cover. So I reckon we should just get on to it. All right. What I know won't challenge you is the idea that resources are finite. The idea that we are halfway through our endowment of the stickiest, gooeyest, most yummiest fuel there's ever been in the universe, so that's oil. We're halfway through that endowment, and I know that doesn't bother you because, you know, the market will, will do something, right? Technology will do something. So I'm not going to challenge you with that. And it, it just isn't going to surprise you or shock you that putting all of that fossil carbon from 150 million years ago into our biosphere now in the form of, of uh, gas in our atmosphere is probably really not a, the best idea we ever had and it's probably changing things <laughs> in a way that probably is not going to really be that good for us because it's just too fast and probably wouldn't be surprised that, that the science behind it is about as rock solid and that we're there now and that we're not slowing down and that there isn't anything the Earth can do to fix what we've done. So I won't challenge you with that. And um, if, I'm not going to try and talk to you about sustainability a whole lot either, because I know that's not going to change anything. That's not, I, you know, like I said, I've been at this for 30 years almost. And I know that talking to you about future generations, the problems of industrialization, of, of fishing of wild species, of, of um, you know, farming in, in highly industrialized ways, of the materials that we use, the, the natural set sort of stuff. I know that's not gonna that's not gonna challenge you either. Because you know you don't have to do it. It's a choice, right? If it's good for marketing, go ahead. But otherwise, it, whatever. I got business to do, right? <laughs> um, so I also know what won't save the planet. So do the other two mechanical engineers. And we can talk till we're blue in the face trying to explain to you why, and you will not believe us, so there's no point in us talking about it. You want me to come back? I'll try. But just believe me, there are no technical green technology solutions to any of this, all right? So, now, what is gonna rock your world? A little bit of math? You gotta argue with math? Yeah. You gonna believe some math? No. <laughs> and you, can always, you can always fix math, right? How about a little brown dot? We're gonna talk about some brown dots, and then we're gonna talk about energy return on investment. Now this you should get. Right? Return on investment. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to invest if you're not getting a return. Probably not the smartest thing to do. So I'm going to try and put my field, energy, into your terms. And then I'm going to tell you about the one bright idea that I'm going with from here on out. <coughs> Alright, the little equation that I showed you, what it essentially explains is that there is no such thing as growth as a plan. There's growth as a temporary state but growth is always boom and bust. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> the market will always come up with some new thing, right? Well, yeah, but whatever it was you were enjoying at the time will boom and bust, right? So that's, that's just the way it is. And that's my challenge to you, is to get your head around that. The, inter the interesting thing about that is that why is it even hard for you to get your head around that? You have a finite amount of something, R, at time zero, R zero. You start to consume it. And each year, time T, each unit of time, you consume a percentage more than you did the time before. That's what we call <coughs> growth, right? That we have an annual growth rate of 1.2, 2.4, we'd like 4, 4%, 5%, 6%. And what happens is we consume that resource and at any given time, we have our t in that year t left. And that little equation tells us that. And that boom and bust is what that equation tells us. That's just the way things are. Why do we have a hard time getting our head around that? Why do we kid ourselves that growth, the truth, the mathematics behind growth being actually not sustainable and boom and bust does not apply to us? 
So we're going to do a little story here, all right? The mythology for our age. <laughs> bacteria. I have a jar full of medium. So this is the stuff that bacteria eat. And I have this jar full of it. And at 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to put one bacteria in that jar. And I'm going to tell you that the rule of the game is that these bacteria divide once in a minute. Okay? So every minute, the bacteria divide, and there's now two of them. So they have a doubling time, which is a function of, uh, it's a way to express that mathematical um, equation. They have a doubling time of one minute. Oh, I'm going to tell you the jar is full at noon. That's when the bacteria have eaten all the food, and they now, they now fill that entire jar. And that's pretty much the end for them. There's no more food left. <laughs> all right, so my question for you is, when is that jar half full? Minutes, minutes right. One minute before noon. Because at noon we have half of the food is eaten. Over that next minute the bacteria divide and they fill the jar. Now what we are going to do is take a little trip into the space of that bacteria. We're going to be in the jar with the bacteria. We're going to see what it's like there at one minute before noon. But actually, I'm thinking that won't be very pleasant. So let's back up to 10 minutes before noon. That's a little bit better. At 10 minutes before noon, um, they've been having a really good time. 120 generations of continuous growth. That is the way the world is. There's always so much more food up there than we could possibly ever consume. Am I right? <laughs> at, <laughs> right? There's so much more. But at 10 minutes till noon, there's some scientists who've been out looking around, observing what's going on. And they've noticed that we can't really go outwards anymore in our growth. We're starting to have to go up. And while there's still more than we can ever even, you know, we just, we just dig a little deeper and there's more. It, there seems to be some evidence that there's a lid. <laughs> that there actually is a finite nature to this sustenance that we're using. What do you think the reception to those researchers is? Not good. <laughs> you know, there's so much more than we could ever use. I just don't know what you guys are talking about. You know, wah, wah, whatever. <laughs> so, the jar at this point, 10 minutes before noon, is 1 1,024th full. Right? There's, there is a lot left. We don't know what the complaining is about. And we also, you know, some of you are saying it's like, it's like 12.01 when we're gonna hit the lid. Some are saying it's 12.59 and a half. You know, the scientists can't even agree when we're gonna hit the lid. So, what, you know, what are we even having this conversation about? The, some, some of the bacteria are getting a bit alarmed. You know, that doesn't seem like it's that far away. It's only 10 generations or so from now. And we need to think about those future generations and what it's going to be like for them as they start, you know, as they slam up against this lead. The government should do something about this, right? I mean, surely. And then there's the other ones. Well, look, we have come so far. We've got data projectors. We've got universities. Look at all the cool stuff we've invented. We'll just come up with some new technologies that help us transition through the lid. <laughs> we'll find substitutes for food. All right? We'll substitute renewable food for the food. <laughs> Somehow, I don't know, but you know, they're working on it. They're paying researchers. Right? They put out very nice pictures. And besides that, we can't just stop growing. Right? We can't. That doesn't, uh, doesn't compute. <coughs> and besides that, Look, when space starts to get scarce, the price will go up and the market will bring new food in. Right? Isn't that what, what's always happened every time, you know, like when we hit the sides and we had to start moving up, then, then the market just brings it in and there's more. There's always been more. Every time we ran out before, like us, you know, whale, we did that first, right? Peak whale, post whale, now we got oil. It all, it's fine, you just find another thing, right? So what story about? Well, and then there's these radical bacteria. You know, probably they have direct bacteria dreadlocks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, well, well, maybe we should change. <coughs> you know, if, 
if what we're doing is not going to be good for people in the bacteria in the future, if, if it's not going to work out, then maybe we should change what we're doing now so that it does work out. Couldn't we do that? Couldn't we, couldn't we get smarter? Couldn't we rethink what we, what we take as our assumptions so that we could, you know, not just slam up against the lid? Don't know. Because a couple minutes later, <laughs> the researchers and the explorers that the government sent out found a whole new jar. <laughs> right? We're saved. It's all good. <laughs> We've got a whole new jar. What could be better? So when is that jar full? You guys did the math pretty good before. <laughs> right. So just before the half full crisis point, they found a whole new jar. And sure enough, that got them to one minute past. It. Because they didn't stop growing. They just couldn't do that. Well, I like to think that we are a little bit smarter than bacteria. I just do. I can't, I can't help it. I just can't get over that. <laughs> that we actually can use that mathematics. And we can use our ability to look forward. It's not our strongest ability. Our strongest ability is clinging to our past and understanding our reality based on our experience. We have to do that. You know? There's a few hairy fairy people who think about the future or what, but, you know, and we need them to challenge us. But we aren't what we are if we don't use our experience and our observations to know where we are and what's going on. And you all know the planes that brought you here are going to take you back. And so I'm talking to you about crazy stuff. But it's about two minutes to noon, eh? And we really got to start using the gray matter. So it's the perspective that we have when we are on that upslope, that perspective filled with what things are like right now filled with the experience that we've had up till now, and that very long run of continuous growth that we had to get here, that really makes it hard for us to understand what we're doing to that generation. That their expectation is gonna be for continued growth. Their consumption rates are gonna be gigantic, and they are gonna to have to deal with what happens. All right, so, all right, but there's renewable energies, right? <laughs> there's, there's other things we can do. And so to get us through where we are going, to my bright idea, we're gonna have to understand the position that we are really in. Yes, we're using up the fossil fuels. Yes, we've used half of those. Yes, we are using those fuels at rates that are so huge that, you know, and yeah, there's still a lot left, but the rate we're using it at, you know, we are using oil right now at a rate that is bigger than any of the giant oil fields per year that have been found in the last 40 years. We are just roaring through it. And we are really going to need that stuff. There isn't anything that, that we do that we can substitute oil for. It just, we need that stuff, which means we got to use a lot less of it quick. So that's what I'm going to convince you of. Now, Hopefully this little cartoon, low-hanging fruit, but that makes sense to you. It doesn't make any sense to go after the high-hanging fruit first, right? The low-hanging fruit are there, they're easy to get, they're plentiful, <coughs> and yet the return that you get on your effort of getting that fruit depends entirely on how much there is, how much you're taking, how much there is um, left, and how much of it um, you know, what's it worth to you to get it? This guy can just sit there and get it. This guy has to climb a ladder. He has to buy a ladder. He has to invest in a ladder to get any. And he cannot get nearly as much as the guy that's sitting there. Right? So that's return on investment. And if you have a finite resource, you have one apple tree, then the rate at which you can consume those apples is on a curve like this. You can speed up very quickly, you can get a lot, but then you have to start really working at getting some more. Now, here's a cartoon of our economy. Our economy is the green part here. The green part is the part that we create as humans, and we, we perceive it as reality, because money, you know, it has this value that we all agree upon. The way that we can trade it for goods and services, it can, it can go from being real, real work, to money, which is sort of not real, it's what we believe it is, to being something real again. I can trade that for food. So it sort of goes around and around this money. But what we do know is that because it's not 
physically real anymore, it's not connected to gold or anything, that we can do what we like about it. We can make more, right? Magic can make more. That's a rule, it's okay, right? You can just make more. You can change what you think about it. You can change the denominations. You can exchange it with other people for theirs. You, know? you can do all these things with it and it's not connected to a physical reality. However, the blue stuff is the physical reality. The physical reality of the resources that we need to run our economy and the waste that we produce when we use those resources. So I've put a little equation here again. Oh, make you think of a jar? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Where are we in there? All right, I've put a little equation here. It's not very hard, it's just your return. Just the, um, what is the return on all of this work of collecting up resources converting them into something that the economy loves to consume, energy, and put it into the economy. So P represents the production, energy production, from our energy system. And then what it took, we had to actually take resources, um, we had to take stuff from the economy, steel, <coughs> and use it in the energy system in order to produce that. We had to take parasitic energy, like not all of the energy that is produced by Huntley Power Station's steam turbine actually comes out of Huntley's power station. About 60 megawatts of it is used to run the cooling towers in Huntley Power Station. Any of you know how much 60 megawatts is? That's the size of Meridian's wind farm. Okay? So we do have to take a serious amount of energy back from what we produce in order to produce it at all. So that I have drawn for you like this. Here comes the energy production that were, you know, comes out of the power plants, comes out of the hydro stations, comes out of the um, uh, the fuel pump, fuel pump. We have to take some of that back in the form of capital equipment and parasitic energy. So that goes back, that's a go to the economy. And then the rest can go to the economy. What do we do with it in the economy? We can consume it, that's the fun part. Right? So we just use it in use. And we can, if we have surplus, we can build new stuff. We can maintain the stuff we're using now. We can you know, fix stuff up, we can build new stuff, new buildings, new cars. Um, so that's the economy part there. That's what's happening. So this is the net energy to the economy, which is what you produce minus what it took you to, or yeah, minus what it took you to produce it. We look at ERY saying that is the ratio of those. So that gives us a return on our investment. All right, so yep with me on that, not too complicated, because we're now gonna look at what happens to these flows as we go along. What we need to understand is that a return of one looks like this. A return of one, energy return on investment, of one means that I had to consume all of the energy I used to make the energy I made. You need to remember that. An energy return of one is not a good investment. It's a bad investment. You got no growth, <coughs> you got no maintenance, and you've got no consumption. I don't know why you did that. Why did you invest in something that had a return of one? The government of the United States of America has invested billions in an energy return of one. <coughs> we'll see in a minute. It's not a good idea. You can't actually run an economy on it. All right, oil has been the best one we've ever found, the best energy source ever, right? The return on investment at the beginning of that consumption of that resource um, was more than 80. So I invest one barrel of oil, I get 80 back every year. Just keeps turning over. That is brilliant. How can you do any better than that? Why would you do anything else, right? Um, then, okay, so, and also look over there. When we first started out in the 1900s, what there, you know, the return was so huge and the consumption was so low and the amount that there was to get was so huge that it was like those bacteria when they're just a wee little layer on the bottom of the jar. <laughs> wow, it is party time. And then you have to start digging deeper and you have to start going farther away. And your EROI, the return on investment, starts to drop. 
So by the time we get to Alaska, which happened after the oil embargo in the 1970s, by the time we decide that it's worth going up to Alaska, digging in the tundra, building a huge pipeline, putting it in boats, and shipping it back down to the United States, that return still is about 20. So it's dropped a lot, but it's still huge. And then by the time we're looking at Gulf, by the time we're looking at Antarctica, um, deep sea stuff, it's not all that great. It's down to about 10 or less than 10. And if we're really getting crazy, going out of our minds, looking for tar sands, looking for fracks, looking for this cool stuff, can we run an economy on this stuff? We can spend really good oil, the 20 stuff, on getting this stuff. And is that getting us anywhere? It's probably a real crazy thing to do. Now yeah, there's economic reasons to do it because that money stuff, we can invest in a bubble. We got a bubble to invest in. We've got fracking, right? We've got an economic bubble to invest in, and that is cool, as long as you're on this side of it, right? And you always convince yourself you will be, that you'll get out before it pops. How about renewable fuels? Let's get that one. Let's, let's grow crops. And what you can see in this diagram, I hope, is why there's seven billion of us. Because there is a huge, huge, huge return on investment in agriculture. I invest a tiny amount of chemicals and fuel and a lot of solar energy, which that solar energy magnitude is 100 times bigger than that. I had to shrink it down by 100 times bigger than that. That is a heck of a lot of free energy. All you got to do is invest in the land and you can get that energy. And I get 2.32 megajoules out. So I've only invested 0.07 units and I got 2.32 out. That's why agriculture works. Huge return on investment if what you're going to do is eat it. If you're going to make fuel out of it, your return on investment is barely one, under one, or slightly over one. You've thrown away that food. That's a, that's a really impressive thing to do. You must be a really rich country to be able to do that, to just throw away that much food. One tank of an American SUV would feed 27 people for a year. You must be a really rich country, and you must not care a whole lot of people are going under somewhere. That's a really interesting decision point to be at. Um, okay, how about others? How about wind? Wind does have a pretty good energy return on investment. It's right up there with coal-fired power generation, and the cost is about the same, but it takes you 20 years to get that return. You don't get it every year. You get it over the whole lifetime of the wind turbine. Solar isn't very good. Three to five return on your investment, and again, it takes the whole 20 years to get that. So are we going to grow on this stuff? I don't think so. Are we going to hope that it means that we can get past the lid? Sure, that's what we do, we hope. Is it gonna do it? Of course we about this. Don't just dismiss me, because it's gonna happen anyway, whether you dismiss me or not. <laughs> so what I want you to think about is what it was like in the 50s when there was indeed so much fuel that we would never be able to use it all up. Of course not, we weren't using very much of it. <laughs> That's what we looked like then. So here's the 1950s, that, that, that blue diagram that I made for you. Energy return on investment of 70. That was a pretty sweet time. What did we do with that? What did our parents do with it, I should say? Well, they had a good time. They built an awful lot of roads, they built an awful lot of buildings. All sorts of fun stuff. They had a surplus that was huge, and they invested it in stuff that needed more energy, unfortunately. So we move along a little bit farther down the road. Energy return on investment is still pretty good. 20. Not bad. We're now at the peak. We're producing the most we ever will. We're producing a lot more energy than we did in the 50s. About five times more. Um, but for every 100 units of energy produced, um, we're still getting 95 into the economy. Problem, we're consuming so much that we really are finding it a little bit hard to maintain what we've built. Is that true? The resources to even maintain what we're doing are seeming to get a little scarce. And growth is getting a, to be a little bit of a problem. Like, why isn't it happening? When are, when are we going to recover? When are we going to get back onto that whatever it was we were on and, and get going again. Well, we're finding it a little hard. Our surplus isn't 75 anymore. It's now down to 35. And we are really demanding a lot. So now I want to move forward a little bit. 
And I'm going to move forward to where we're, we're getting to the not so cool oil. We're having to dig deep. We're having to go far. And the sweet stuff that we were using before is really running down. Um, and what you see is that we, we do actually, growth isn't an option anymore. The only thing we have left, because we don't even have enough to fuel what we've already built, is to reduce what we use, conserve, invest anything we can in how to use less, and um, maintenance and replacement, not of things that use a lot. Every time we turn something over, it's got to be in something that uses a heck of a lot less. And by the time we get to 2050, it looks like this. Have we invested in the system that runs well and prospers on that much energy instead of on the, the 60 that I had there before? With 40 years from now, when people look back at us and I look at what we invested in, if it was bigger roads, they're going to want to get a hold of us. If it was bigger buildings, if it was bigger anything, they're going to want to know why we thought that was a good idea. Investing in things that use less is the option we have now. It is the only way to prosper in the downhill side of that boom and bust because that's where we are now. Okay, the peak happened in 2006. We are on that downhill slide. We're working our way over. Um, just one more thought to have. Okay, I just can't accept that we can't just substitute renewables. A couple of you will know what it takes to build a wind turbine. You tell me, what size wind turbine farm do I need to run a factory that makes wind turbines? Don't work that way. What size solar farm do I need to run a fab lab to make solar cells? Does not work that way. You do not have any renewable energy without fossil energy. Think wisely about what you do with that fossil energy. It's all you've got, and it's really good stuff. All right. Um, here's some research that we've done actually looking at all the energy sources. We've been sort of focusing on oil, but oil fuels everything else. Um, if you say that net energy to the economy over the next um, century or so, what does it look like? Put it all together. You can dig it all up and put it all in the air, and it doesn't matter. You're going to have less. These decisions right now are really crucial. My big idea, survive it. Prosper in that condition. How do you do that? You adapt. That's all we got. That's all we've ever had. Humans adapt. You don't believe me? Start looking around the world. We adapt. When we don't adapt, we aren't there anymore. That's your choice. Either adapt or not. <laughs> it's your choice. I don't know. Adaptation, how do I think it's going to happen? Um, I think that we will understand what we did about 100 years ago when we started understanding that our safety was killing us, that we were killing ourselves. Our factories were death traps. Uh, the average worker's um, life expectancy when they walked into a textile mill was four years. They weren't going to make it out after. No, they weren't going to live longer than four years. The death toll daily in American coal mines was what it is annually now. Okay? Things, the workplace products, the, the, your transport systems were not safe places. In a hundred <coughs> years, that has changed dramatically. And why has it changed dramatically? Why are we now safe from our own successes? <laughs> It was pretty much engineering. The history of safety is that the, the, a group of 62 mechanical engineers in New York City decided we can do better than this. It wasn't the politicians. It was not the economy. It was the engineers. You're going to turn loose your engineers? You know what the trick is? Honesty. I am telling you the truth. I'm not telling you fancy nice stories about hydrogen anymore. I'm not telling you nice stories about biofuels or wind or solar anymore. I've worked on all those things. I know how they work. I'm not telling you those stories anymore. They're not going to get you anywhere. I'm telling you the truth. We've got to change, and we've got to change in big ways. And you have got to allow your engineering professions to completely become honest, come clean, and start changing everything to use less fossil fuel, because we are going to need that stuff for a long time. Putting it into the air right now is not the thing that the third generation is asking us to do. They're asking us to leave some for them. The jar is finite, there is a lid on it. <laughs> and changing ourselves is what we've got left. Changing how we do things. Is that possible? Absolutely. Are we doing it? Not very much. It's time to get onto that job. So this is my conclusion, really. My challenge to you, this is a new century. This century will not be like the last century. You can already sort of tell that it's not. 
you can hope that there's a recovery coming. It isn't. Where are you going to get resources to build new things? From using less. That's the only place there is. That's what's left. All right, so no matter what technologies you try to invest in, no matter what we do, there is the future is what it's going to be. Um, and we've got to absolutely stop this massive rush to the dirty energy resources. Why? Because they're draining our good resources. They're not returning anything. I know they're a lovely economic boom. They're a place to invest that you can get some, some growth. But that's, that's make-believe growth. Overall, they're draining us of good resources. Very good natural gas is, is going down the drain there. Very good petroleum is going down the drain to make bad petroleum. It's got to stop. Fracking is the same thing. And they make huge messes that we won't have the energy to clean up. Got to stop it um, without even you know, being a greenie. It's just a dumb decision. Um, I don't know if you have any power whatsoever to form, you know, to, to produce any changes like this. I don't know if it's a challenge to your business, but what, it's what has to happen. And then finally, conservation and demand reduction is where we get prosperity for the future. That's where it is. What does that look like? Who's going to do it? Um, again, I don't know anybody but engineers who are really in a position to make this happen. But they have to, number one, come clean, be honest about what's possible and what's not. Stop just accepting the government research money. I, I'll, we'll have fun with it, but we will not solve your problems. Big government block of money just came out. Carbon capture and storage, complete fantasy. Fluff, nothing there. Oh, I have a fun time playing with some amines or something, whatever. But it's nothing, it's a waste of money. Don't do it. <laughs> we don't have the time to do it anymore. 20 years ago, maybe, no, not now. All right, so that's my mission to you. Got your head around that? <laughs>